When you ask a group of youngsters to co-create with you something for the future, you are unleashing an immense power. And trust me, not everything is related to knowledge and experience. As long as you are dealing with a group of people who have reasonably good brains on their shoulders and they can actually think and they would want to do something that would disrupt the models that we are operating in, challenge the status quo and take you to a different position, that's the right mix that you should be having. You cannot spend behind 100 ideas because that would be too much. You need to pick a few ideas, you adjust the ideas to what the business needs, you assign a certain budget and you go in with. Even if you lose the budget, even if it becomes a failure, at least you understand that when you've learned what to correct in the next time. And that's what we've agreed with the business. So we had a fund for experimentation mm -hmm. and that's how we've managed to utilize that. There were times around the IR4 when the digital transformation have stopped kicking in. Mm -hmm. Start hearing words around AI, IoT, blockchains, RPAs. Lots of stuff at that point in time, we didn't know how can you actually utilize that in the business. And that was almost like eight, nine years back. Mm -hmm. And what would it mean for us? And there were times that we wanted to become a group of the first adopters mm -hmm. of those kind of technologies. Mm -hmm. And how can we utilize that to do our business research? And what we've created around that point in time, we've created this a team that have the leadership team, but also have pretty much fresh young talents. That was almost an average age in the company of almost one to two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they come straight from college, very high hopes, very <laughs> high energy. Cruz, how do you uh, promote a culture that can promote also the disruptive thinking inside an organization? So uh, again, being disruptive or trying to actually um, look into the things that will move or create a movement in the needle in the work that you're doing requires that you give them psychological safety as well in terms of how uh, they can operate, how do you think. And you, first of all, in terms of the brainstorming sessions that you're doing, there is no idea as a stupid idea. And secondly, is how can you encourage people to experiment? And with experimentation, you should be ready to succeed and you should be ready to fail. And largely, you should be ready to fail more than succeed because by design or by definition, experimenting would result into that. And if unless you do that and you create a culture that would challenge uh, the status quo and challenge where you are in terms of uh, ways of working, you will not be able to um, take it to the next step. So... There are two kinds of, or two different kinds of improvement that I believe in. One is improvement that keeps happening within a certain curve. Mm -hmm. So that's where you improve your KPIs. Today you are at efficiency of 60, you move to 65, you move to whatever. Mm -hmm. That's an improvement of within the curve itself. Only through disruptive thinking, you can do curve shift, where you go into a total mm -hmm. different curve that's way ha higher and above what you've been working with in the past. But definitely, there is a cost for doing that. It will not come naturally that uh, people believe in new ideas. And if you look into some of the big companies around you, how they were very conventional in the way they operate and how they didn't manage to survive lots of changes that have happened around them, and now nobody would hear about them. There are companies that around my age was actually, uh, or my, my youth, it was... Mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, the number one companies that you would want to join or among the top 10 that you would want to join, today they don't exist. And why they don't exist? Because they didn't think about the disruption that was happening around them and disrupt their own models to get there. So uh, continuous disruption of what you're doing, you're challenging the status quo, is very much needed for future growth. For a people or a team, they're working on the same organization, and such a disruptive thinking could be also scary, right? Uh, how do you break these boundaries for people that maybe they are afraid to fail? How do you promote it? So first of all, you you play with them. Mm -hmm. You don't get them to play at all. You play with them. Yani, um, let me give you a small example, uh, but yani, a recent example. We have many, but a recent example. There were times around the IR4 when the digital transformation have stopped kicking in. Mm -hmm. Start hearing words around... AI, IoT, blockchains, RPAs, lots of stuff. At that point in time, we didn't know how can you actually 
utilize that in the business. And that was almost like eight, nine years back. Mm -hmm. And what would it mean for us? And there were times that we wanted to become the group of the first adopters mm -hmm. of those kind of technologies. Mm -hmm. And how can we utilize that to do our business usage? And what we've created around that point in time, we've created this a, a team that have the leadership team, but also have pretty much fresh young talents that was almost an average age in the company of almost one to two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they come straight from college, very high hopes, very <laughs> high energy. The way they think about things are totally different to the way also we've been thinking about stuff. So it was quite good to get them all together along with the leadership team and try to operate on 5,000 feet and 50,000 feet and see what can we do to create a disruption in the business or use those technology to create the next level of disruption that we would want and challenge the status quo. And we've given a brief to the team, the young team, to actually go unconstrained and think about how do they um, come with ideas that we think would be future fit, that would create a difference in the future in the way that we're doing business. And they will be supported, not challenged by us as the leadership. Mm -hmm. And whenever there is a challenge, we'll keep the challenge in the room, but we will actually allow them to experiment. And we've set a certain budget that we would work with so that because again, you cannot you bust the bank while doing that. <laughs> And then we said, one of the criteria that we look at is the how the idea is good enough for the business. Mm -hmm. And the other item would be how easy it can be implemented or what does it take to implement it, but also what does it take to scale it? So scalability was another aspect to it. And that team have came back with 20 different ideas, if I recall, almost 20, 21. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. What they have came up with was something that I think now, after eight, nine years, I've started seeing it happening in lots of other businesses around us. But those teams have imagined and created those ideas and briefs and everything seven, eight years back. So it gives you uh, the power of unleashing the potential of brains that you are having within an organization mm -hmm. to co-create. And instead of just working on a strategy that you would top down, give it to the people to just run with and execute. Mm -hmm. When you ask a group of youngsters to co-create with you something for the future, you are unleashing an immense power. And trust me, not everything is related to knowledge and experience. As long as you are dealing with a group of people who have reasonably good brains on their shoulders and they can actually think and they would want to do something that would disrupt the models that we are operating in, challenge the status quo and take you to a different position, that's the right mix that you should be having. Mm -hmm. And all what you need to provide at that point in time is to play with them. So I was part of that team with them, mm -hmm. personally. And I was enjoying those sessions a lot. The other thing is to support them, coach them, and also protect them. So there were times where they were presenting to super senior management <laughs> in the organization. And definitely, you don't expect that everybody would connect on the same mm -hmm. level. But my role was, how can I protect them? How can I isolate any negativity or frustrations? Because I knew that out of the 20 ideas, if two ideas or three ideas would be a success, that was good enough for me. I didn't want the 20 ideas to succeed. And today, some of those ideas have created some big shifts in the way that we operate in the business. Uh, do you have any like situation or story that we can narrate it to people about disruptive thinking that you have had in your experience? Fine. So I I've given you one of mm. the stories, but if you ask me, uh, for example, the other story was around the time that we had, uh, everybody was talking about AI before ChatGPT <laughs> and all that long time back. Mm. So eight years back, there were actually lots of talks around how can we utilize AI and machine learning into the stuff that we are doing. And we didn't know which platforms can we start with within supply chains to start with that. Definitely manufacturing was one of those areas. The other area was the kind of the demand fulfillment in a sense, how to get to the right signals of demand mm -hmm. and how to link our products to some quite far 
trends that mm -hmm. have an impact, but you would never know through the normal algorithms that we're using to get that as drivers in terms of your um, demand fulfillment. So we've created two platforms or two teams, one to work on how can we improve our forecast accuracy in terms mm -hmm. of demand planning and what the market would want and what would be the key trends that we need to look at that can help us that today we are not considering. Mm -hmm. Because when you are creating demand, you are trying to see definitely what you get from the system is the baseline, which is your historical <laughs> yeah. data. But also you have to put on top of that your activities. Mm -hmm. And you have to put on that also any new innovation sure. or whatever that you'll bring so that you get to your demand. Baseline is historical. How can you actually, after creating that, create um, a qualitative aspect about the trends that's happening around you that would create an extra demand? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you are in fast-moving consumer goods, the population and the size of the population matters a lot to the rate of consumption that you're having. Mm -hmm. If you are operating in a city like Dubai, let's give me an example, give you an example on Dubai. If you are operating in a city like Dubai, and you have huge touristic traffic that's coming in and out for Dubai. By monitoring the number of flights that's landing every day, mm -hmm. you would understand what would, and the, the length of people staying in the country, you would understand what would that mean in terms of extra opportunities of unleashing, mm -hmm. extra demand creation that you can do, and you can consider that into your forecast accuracy as well. Yeah. So. There are lots and lots and lots of that. But uh, what I'm trying to say is how to utilize normally historical trends would not show you that. Mm -hmm. How can you utilize AI into getting there? And we've managed to improve our forecast accuracy, if I recall, by 10%, which is 1,000 base points mm -hmm. by utilizing that kind of technology. And it was a couple of young team members who've been championing that going forward. And uh, again, uh, we, we didn't expect or anticipate that that would be a great success or it will add lots to the, to the team. So uh, that was one example. The other example was around manufacturing, for example, mm -hmm. where we've tried to utilize normally for those who are acquainted with manufacturing, we do, uh, whether you are working on batch system or continuous system, you do take lots of samples and you try to actually analyze those samples to make sure that from a quality perspective, you are within norms. Mm. And there were times actually that we need to stop the line to make sure that we take the sample and do that. And we wanted to kind of introduce what would it mean to do uh, a machine learning mm -hmm. combined with AI to try and, and to readjust the equipment automatically based on operating range that we are operating. And instead of you actually waiting to see what's the results and eliminate that. and through a group of young motivated team, we've managed to actually um, get that. And it has saved us lots of time and also lots of money. Because with time, actually it was self-corrected on the equipment. Mm -hmm. With the high speed lines that we're putting, we also had a team that would do all the quality control aspect through cameras, digital cameras and everything to make sure that you are not being uh, uh, in need of actually taking samples, checking whether the label has skewness or wrong labeling or whatever, whatever. And also we've utilized the same technology to do our new equipments that we purchased already. We've done all our trials and all our, uh, how do I say, testing remotely. So we used to send our team to the manufacturers to try the equipment and check if they are up to the speed that we want, efficiency. And what are the approaches that maybe you are using it to convince the organization about some ideas that maybe it will help them. It's not an easy one. And again, uh, and that's a very good point. I mean, the point is, as I've been saying at the beginning, you cannot look at supply chain and isolation of the business and supply chain can should be an enabler for the business to deliver on what uh, we want. Mm. And accordingly, lots of those new initiatives was not just, I've given you some examples that relate to supply chain because mm. we're talking about supply chain. Yes. Lots of the other disruptions that we've been doing and the thinking of that group that we've been talking about was very much tapping on market opportunities, mm -hmm. be it on customization of products, be it on actually uh, refilling stations that we want to do, L lots of stuff that we wanted to actually create in the marketplace based on the trends, be it on DCOM or be it on um, uh, trends that relate to uh, personalized and customized products 
And accordingly, you need to mobilize lots of other team members from the business through that. And it was quite important that we started in the right foot so that we will not have a kind of, um, how do I say, an opposing force mm -hmm. to get or slow down the speed that we want mm -hmm. to have. So the starting point was after that team worked, for example, on those projects, and we identified the top five projects that we would want to work with the rest of the business on. Mm -hmm. We've presented to the SCLT, which is the supply chain leadership team, and I was there. And then we've challenged the team with most of the business questions that can come down their way. Mm -hmm. Then we've taken the team, the young team, I mean, they were one or two years old in the business, to present to the most senior stakeholders of the business itself. And before going into that, we were given the right brief to the leadership team. And we said, mm. that's a kind of a very important moment. Those guys have been working for so long to get to those projects and those ideas. And it's up to you to see what's good in them and what can we scale and what we can look at. And it's up to you also to defeat the purpose of having all that and challenge too much to the extent that will kill the ideas. And being a business leader, they all also knew that that can be a good shift for the business and they should mm. kind of motivate and promote for that to happen. So in return, what have happened post the team presenting, it landed very positively with the stakeholders. And the stakeholders have nominated also some of their team members mm -hmm. more with the extended team so that we created a cell from different functions to run through when it makes sense. Where it didn't make sense, first of all, we were the first challenging lines. The second one is actually the rest of the business because, as we said, it's also good to listen to others in terms of what do you feel and what's the reflection on the, what you're trying to put on the table. You cannot spend behind 100 ideas because that would be too much. Mm -hmm. You need to pick few ideas. You adjust the ideas to what the business needs. You assign a certain budget and you go in with even if you lose the budget, even if it becomes a failure, at least you understand that you've learned what to correct in the next time. And that's what we've agreed with the business. So we had a fund for experimentation. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've managed to utilize that. There was a board to choose the ideas that we will experiment with. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get everybody yeah. to work with you. And instead of you working alone in a side. How do you prioritize the, such uh, uh, projects? Is it financial perspective, ROI, or is it Something that maybe so you definitely have... Definitely all the elements that you're saying is part of it. But mm. again, if you remember, I've told you three criteria at the beginning. Mm. First of all, how disruptive it is and how can it create a shift going forward? Mm. What would be the difficulties in doing it or how can we actually do what's needed? Mm -hmm. And the third one is basically scalability. So even if it is very profitable, even if it has a very good ROI, but you cannot scale it later on, and then it becomes a bit of not on the top priority. I would rather create, if I have an idea that would generate me uh, an X amount of opportunity and would let me spend 10% of that X, 20, 30, 40, 50, it's good. But if I have an idea that would actually create 10%, uh, sorry, 10 Xs of what, what I've been aiming for because it had the scalability, even if I am actually spending more money on it and worth prioritization. So there were always the elements of those kind of three elements that we are looking at while evaluating uh, and also what budget do we need as a startup budget to go for that. Because sometimes when the amount of money that you need to spend is huge, then it needs more deeper research. If it's not, then you start somewhere and then you iterate as you go. You don't try to perfect it before you move on. Unleash is the bridge between my purpose and my mission. And my mission is unleashing the human greatness to its utmost potential.